well, welcome everyone. I see we have people from all over Hawaii, Florida, Minnesota, Mesa, uh, call, Mesa County, so Grand Junction, Colorado, Chicago, Littleton, Massachusetts, Nebraska, Hanover, Colorado, Arizona, New Hampshire, Vermont, Denver, New York, California, Connecticut. This is awesome. And we always love seeing who's coming from where. Um, that's one of our favorite things about these forums. And Ellen, myself, and Sierra from Generation Schools Network are here in Denver, Colorado, in different parts of Denver, Colorado. So it's great to see all of you today. And welcome to our executive function monthly SEL webinar. Today, we're gonna to be talking about some strategies that you can use with your students. But the first part of our presentation will delve into the components of executive function and what that is exactly. So thank you for joining us once again. And just a few items before we start, we are recording this meeting. And we are recording the meeting, and you'll get the slides, the recording, and the certificate of completion that will be shared via email afterwards. So at the end of the session, we'll be posting a survey in the chat box. And you, when you fill that out, that will tell us that you were here, that you attended the session, and then we'll send you the slides and the recording and your certificate of completion for those of you who need continuing education credits. And then you please stay muted, but and uh, you're feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you have a comment or a question while we're presenting. If you do have questions, please chat them, put them in the chat box as well. That's fine to unmute or put them in the chat box or comments that you have, ideas or connections that you make. And then if you want to access the live transcript, in the you can see that using your settings in Zoom. And if you need to know how to do that, just type in the chat box and Ellen and Sierra can help you with that. Um, also, when we go into our breakout rooms, if you're able, please turn on your video so that you can meet and connect with others. So I'm Donna Trujillo. I'm the Vice President of Tiered Supports and Special Populations with Generation Schools Network. Um, prior to coming to Generation Schools, I started my career as a special education teacher for middle school. I've taught all ages, birth to 21, including preschool. Um, right before I went, came on with GSN, I was the director of all 90 schools for special education in Douglas County, which for those of you who are not in Colorado, that's the third largest district in Colorado. And then I went on to work with this wonderful organization and fantastic people. So hopefully you can learn something today. I always say if I can take away one new learning or one idea, have one new connection during a professional development, it was worth my time. So hopefully we'll give you at least one thing, maybe more new today to think about or consider. So here's our agenda today. We'll first be doing a warm-up warm -up activity. We'll talk about what executive function is the impact of executive function on social emotional learning, and then how that ties to the CASEL SEL competencies. And then the importance of our self-identity in executive functioning, strategies to use in the classroom. We'll be doing the wrap up. And as I said before, we'll have a feedback survey at the end to capture our attendance and to get your free resources and certificate. So our warm up today. In the chat, list your routine and also what happens if you're not able to follow your morning routine. So we all have our morning routines. What is something, what are the things that you like to do and what happens if you're unable to follow it? Give you a few minutes to do that.
So I see coffee, gym, breakfast. The whole day is thrown off if any of them don't happen. Quiet devotional time, wake up, walk, grab a cup of coffee, get distracted or pulled away. If you, if you get distracted or pulled away, your day's not as productive. Um, not being able to check phone or news, journal or stretch, shower, and then coffee. And if something goes wrong, Cassandra said, bad mood, stressed out. Um, providing students with sensory input right after breakfast. So that's relating to students. Yep, that's great to do for them. Get them centered and ready for their day. Meditate, exercise. Um, one, Vanessa doesn't like to do the same thing every morning. Uh, mercy me, shower, tea, walk the dog. If the shower doesn't happen, doesn't feel awake. Um, give students a warm up while they're while the teacher's trying to get something done. Podcast on the way to work. Get to work early. Exercise, shower, eat breakfast, fill off. Less focused if not able to exercise. If uh, not able to do the morning routine, get off task and disruptive. Forgetting to do what next, what happens next, and throws off in a different mindset causes anxiety if you can't follow it. Um, have a backup activity to keep kids busy. Okay, great morning routine here from Katie. Um, if you miss something, throw me off and not help me be ready for the day. So why we do this activity is our routines are our executive function. And if we do not follow those routines, they throw us off. And it's the same for our students or our children at home. Routine is key to people's lives. And even if you don't follow the same routine every day, if you're not able to do certain things at the start of your day or something happens, it can mess up the whole rest of the day. And just like that in the morning, every moment of the day for students, they can get thrown off easily too if they don't know how to do something, how to start something and how to complete something. So we're gonna be talking talking about some strategies, but first let's talk about what executive function is. So these are the skills that allow us to self-regulate and enable us to plan, focus, and give attention to things, remember instructions, and like many of us, we have to juggle multiple tasks throughout the day. So a great analogy to this is the air, air traffic control system. So at a busy, airport, planes coming in from all directions, arrivals and departures, trying to keep the planes landing on the right runway, keeping them up, who needs to land first, who needs to land next and not have collisions. We and our brains need the skill set to appropriately manage those multiple tasks and distractions. And I do have a question in the box that I want to address real quick. Um, you do get this presentation after we will be giving you the survey at the end and you fill out that survey and then we'll have your email to give you this recording the presentation and the certificate so i just went into an executive function there by answering that chat but refocusing now we have to go through our day managing multiple tasks as do our students they're shifting from teacher to teacher from classroom to classroom and trying to hold it all together. So it's important that we take the time to establish that executive function and teach them the skills necessary to be able to do so. So how does it link to SEL or social emotional learning? It includes academic skills like critical thinking and remembering and following those multi-step directions. But it also facilitates our social emotional capacities. I know one of you mentioned anxiety, if you can't follow your routine in the, in the day. So those, that executive function component of our minds help to us control those strong emotions and adjust when something changes, when it's, whether it's a rule or a routine or something happens that in your life that you have to, wasn't, weren't expecting. And then persistence, how students really just look at a task follow plan for that task and follow through to complete it. And then if we know 
how we are feeling and recognize how we are feeling and have the skills to cope and still manage those multiple tasks, it helps us understand our emotions as well as others. So SEL and executive function. Here's a, here's a model of the brain to give you some a picture of how everything is integrated together. So as you can see, there's a lot going on in our minds when we are completing tasks or getting through our days. We have to keep everything in, 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 in our minds at the same time and keep that control going and moving forward. The working memory is involved, reactions and responses, those risk reward decisions, emotions, behavioral control, use of rules, that error processing, it all comes together and forms our exec executive function. And there is that reciprocal relationship between SEL and executive function, and as well as our relationships with others, which is a foundation of social emotional learning. And then how can we help? So children aren't just born with executive function skills. These are learned skills. And it takes time and effort and connections with others to be able to do so. And the, to just start at the very basic of all of this is to support and encourage students with their smallest efforts. We need to model the skills. If a teacher is a train wreck in their classroom, the students are watching. We have to show them and even talk out loud when we're doing things and explain why we're doing them, not just do them because kids can learn through that too. And if we engage them in activities and opportunities to practice the skills, I know for my kids, you know, middle school, they start learning how to take notes, sometimes elementary too, but really middle school, a lot of their teachers taught them different ways to take notes, different ways to execute their projects and practice those skills, not just saying here, do this. We have to teach that. And then that providing that consistent, consistent, reliable presence is so important. If you're present with them, they will come to you and ask for help. If they trust you, they will come to you. And that's, again, something that doesn't just happen naturally. It's through spending time connecting and learning about each student as an individual or even each adult as an individual to help them grow with you and come alongside of them. And then we have to guide them from complete dependence on adults to gradual independence. Again, not just saying do this, have fun, good luck, but really teaching them here's the next step. And then one of the biggest things, so many of our students have experienced trauma and Ellen and I have been working on restorative practices, implementation and processes and pr professional development with GSN. And one of the things the coach that taught us was that if we stop and take a moment, there is no one currently on earth that hasn't experienced the traumatic event. Can anyone guess in the chat what that traumatic event is? or was? I'll give a second for that. Yes, Stacy, the pandemic. So every person walking on the earth has experienced the trauma of the pan pandemic. <laughs> Ginger birth, <laughs> yeah, we all went through birth too. Yeah, but it really is that pandemic. Some of us cope differently than others, depending on our support systems and our circumstances, but we're all now have one trauma, traumatic piece in our experience. And so relating that to our students and our executive functioning and even ourselves, we really had to relearn and adapt and become resilient as humans, even more so than we ever had in the past. Well, our current culture here more so. So how does this correlate? I, Ellen, are we doing breakout rooms here? I think the plan for this is just via chat. Okay, so what I want you to do in the chat is look at these Castle Core competencies. So we have self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. 
which of these five components of CASEL correlate to executive function? So in the chat, type out which ones of these relate to executive function. Wendy all, Vanessa all. I see a self-management, self-management, lots of alls. K all. Let's see. Let's see the answer. Correct. Those of you, it is all. And here are some examples of how they do relate. So for self-management, that's being an ability to follow multi-step directions, self-awareness, av avoiding those distractions, controlling our rash responses. Also for self-management, the ability to remember, recall that working memory piece comes in, the responsible decision-making, managing long-term assignments, persistent problem solving, and then the relationship skills, collaborating with others. Collaborating with others, Oftentimes as educators, we think, oh, putting kids in groups. It's not just that, it's also having the ability to seek help when needed or asking those deeper questions when something is not clear or you want more information. So yes, all of that comes together. And you can also see on the castle wheel, it's not just the person at the center, it's the whole community, it's all the classrooms, the schools, homes, communities, families, everything comes together to support that person to be able to be successful. So there are some critical developmental factors. Um, when students engage in play, they learn to talk with each other, to communicate, they establish relationships. They have opportunities to engage with others. And through that play, they can plan different, plan different activities, talk about the aspects of things. I know when I would play with my Barbie dolls, right? You had to set up the house right first. You had to talk about who was gonna be this one and who was gonna be that and what we were, and as we were going through the activity or playing together, where was that Barbie gonna go? She had to get dressed up. What does she need to get together? So play can really be a strong foundation for developing not only executive functioning, but the social emotional learning. And a lot of times now I was talking to some of my husband and I own a restaurant. I was talking to a customer yesterday about the importance of students just getting out and children getting outside and encouraging them to get outside or get out of their rooms and interact and bring their imagination to life and explore nature and their surroundings, if they're able, or even if they're in the city, being able to engage and become creative and problem solve when they are working together to find solutions. Those connections with each other are a critical component for development. And then the importance of self-identity and executive function. We really need to have students know who they are. Think about how others see them and then have that inspiration and empowerment to think about not just their current circumstances, but what is possible for them. And even as us as adults, when we're working with students, we need to know these things. We need to know, okay, who am I as a teacher? On Monday, I well, that was yesterday, I presented to a, a school and we talked about this a lot. Um, we did a self-care activity and we really delved into who they are as a teacher and what, if they're whole for themselves and understand themselves and their emotions. One of the participants said, you know, I noticed the other day I was driving to work and I was really angry and I didn't know why. And then I realized I forgot to eat breakfast. And if knowing those things and being able to explore your emotions can help you then, okay, I just need to eat, I'll be okay. Or this is really bothering me. I can tell someone and, and get it out or do something like a journal to be able to move forward. It's really important to understand this and for us to give the students we interact with the skills to do so. 
So we're gonna watch a quick video. During this video, I want you to focus on those three questions that we just saw. So who are these people? How do others see them? What, what made them want to do this? And how did they make this possible? Okay. I can't imagine doing some of those things they did, but it's pretty fantastic. So for those, those people in that video doing that, think of the executive function and planning that had to come together for that. And also them doing that video likely gave them the sense of identity. And it was something that they related to and as a community related to working with others to pull off these feats of craziness. And crazy, it's just, I could never do it, but that's what they do. And so that's what we're trying to teach our kids is you can do anything that you desire and you can bring others along with you and support you. So the components of execu executive functioning that are important, um, that flexible thinking, that is critical to be able to adjust to those ex unexpected changes. And I, as a special educator, some of many of my students actually didn't have that flexibility. And so I had to work with them to work through that anxiety and the feelings and recognize how they were feeling to be able to adapt and move forward or even giving them pre-warnings. Like if there was a fire drill happening, the administrator of the school would come to me so that I could tell those students who I knew would struggle with that, that it was coming and prepare them and tell, talk to them ahead of time. Here's what's going to happen. Here's when it's going to happen. And here's what we're going to do. And sometimes we even practice before the fire drill. The working memory that keeps our key information in mind. And so we have to pull that out. And some students, when they get their evaluations, especially those special education students, the students with significant learning disabilities really struggle with working memory. So visual reminders are important for students or even tying a picture with a word. So that then when, you, when they see that picture, it jogs their memory. Um, but we use our working memory in everything we do. And self-monitoring. Like we said before, how are you feeling at that moment? That self-awareness is so important to then work through that feeling and be able to move past it. And students need support with that. That planning and prioritizing to meet and set goals, teach students how to plan and how to prioritize. And later in the presentation, we'll be watching a video related to that. Task initiation, I'm sure we have had all had students that just can't start a task. They'll avoid that task. They'll lash out. They'll start getting angry or create another issue just to avoid that. And even as adults, sometimes we do that. And we'll just keep avoiding it, keep avoiding it. And we just have, sometimes you just have to take that first step to help yourself and help others initiate. And then organization. How do we keep things both physically and mentally on track? That impulse control, again, younger students and many actually till we're 26, our, our cognitive abilities are still forming. So impulse control can be difficult and we have to talk through with students how to control their impulses, maybe why they're feeling they need to do that, that now and keep them on track with that. And then that emotional control, keeping our feelings in check. Again, if you look at it, I would love to see arrows crossing all of these, all of these areas together because they're all interrelated and no one is more important than the other. And I have a question, does autism impact task initiation and organization? Absolutely. For some students it does, 
not all depends on their ability and that where they're at on the spectrum, but many of them, it does. Um, I have a lot of clients that I work with, with autism and they definitely just need that support. And sometimes for them, they need an example of what the end product is. And actually that benefits a lot of students because then they can see that there's an end and then backward planning. And we'll be talking more about that in a minute and some strategies to use there. So wise mind. One of my colleagues developed what's called the moat note and that's where this image comes from. The moat note is a tool, executive functioning tool to teach students about their brains, about executive function, with the many different strategies embedded in that moat note. It's a little book that they can use to practice and learn about executive functioning. So with the wise mind, it's the space where your emotional mind and lo logical mind overlap. So we teach students, wise people live in the wise mind. So our emotional mind is just as important as our logical mind and vice versa. They have to be able to come together to form that wise mind. And when we do that, we're able to focus and move forward and initiate our tasks and complete those tasks. So this video is always a great one. I love it. I'm just gonna play it for you and, and, you'll, and we'll see what you think after. There is certain foundational skills like executive function, self-regulation that are prerequisites for the formation of more complex skills like perseverance and self-direction. A child can become a productive and engaged learner from any developmental starting point as long as we intentionally build those skills. Any volunteers go up and do a priority list? Abdi, thank you. The most active research right now is actually about adolescence. There are skills that develop uniquely in adolescence that can't develop in earlier periods. An example of one of those is executive function skills, which enable us to organize and prioritize. Right. By asking students to prioritize their tasks, the teacher builds that skill set in an entire classroom. In eighth grade, there's a ton of different deadlines and work to manage. So we do the ABC priority list in order to help them manage all those different deadlines. Somebody always goes up to start a priority list. It helps us like categorize everything that we need to have and like organize from most important to like, you know, least important. We have the West Virginia versus Barnard case questions for social studies. What does that do? Today. So that's a high priority. Well, we have a practice class that we need to do for science class. They tell me each assignment and like when it's due or like uh, how important it is. We have the dryas of observation for science. Oh, wow. Jeez. They share out all the different deadlines that are roaming around in their head. And then they know how to go through the protocol of prioritizing. Can you help Abdi to figure out what the A1 is? On dryas observation? So, because it's overdue, right? So, if it's overdue, you got to get that done first. And then, what would be in A2? Oh, uh, the West Virginia first part of questions. It wasn't a teacher saying you should, it was a student saying, here's what I think are the ways in which these activities should be prioritized. So, in effect, what this teacher was doing was modeling and teaching executive function skills. If you're kind of overwhelmed by your work, then you can kind of like know what to do first and then just kind of like, like categorize it and get it done efficiently. Okay, so which one of those things is probably going to be your frog? Mark Twain said, if you wake up every morning and eat a frog, everything else will taste great. So I taught them to take their frog from the list, which is the thing they want to do the least, and get it out of the way, because everything else will seem easy. A frog is like the most important assignment, like the one I'm really worried about. Dry ice. So, okay, you got to do that. What's your frog? 
it helps me like realize I need to get this done faster than I need to get this done. So even though this is more fun, I need to get this out of the way before I can do this. So as soon as we're done with that priority list, I notice everyone gets right to work because they have it spelled out very clearly for them. This is the building of executive function skills in kids. I love that video because I love the idea of the frog, but that's what works for students is helping them prioritize, helping them get unstuck, helping them understand what to do next and not feel that overwhelming sense of, I don't even know what I'm going to do. I like sometimes when I'm so busy and have so much on my list, I, I feel like weighted down and sometimes like you can't breathe. And so it's important for us to teach the students that, get it out, throw it out there, prioritize it. And then which piece is going to be your frog? Let's get through that first. It's a great strategy for being able to support students and really model, teach and coach them with executive function. And it seems very simple, but many, many people don't even think about that give the assignment, let's go, right? Or take the moment in the day to check in on the students. What do you have to do? And what do you need to do next? And what are you going to do first? And then what's next? And Ellen was so gracious. She shared the link to the moat note that where we got that wise mind diagram from. If you're interested in exploring that further, the link is in the chat. Oops, sorry. There is certain counting. I mean, okay. So here's, now we're moving into the strategies, the specific strategies that students need and some things you can do for them. So just like we started off with our warm-up, routine matters. So here's some ideas for some routines. Posted visual schedule of the day, the class, the subject. As a teacher, I would every day before I left, I would put up the schedule and what we were doing first, next, and if there were any changes, I would do that before I left at the end of the day. So when my students came in the next morning, they would see that and we would go through that. And that also provided a consistent routine for them. They knew ahead of time what was happening and what they needed to get done. It was already broken out for them. And then we would work through those. And I would have students go up and check off when we got done with the task one of the students would go up and check off that it was done or cross it off so they could see their progress and start seeing that they were making, they were moving forward and getting to closer to being finished. I also like to make sure that um, materials are available and kept in the same classroom and they're organized. How many times as teachers do we have to give kids pencils or paper? They walk in and their books are scattered everywhere. One of the things I did for my students was I had individual folders, just the paper folders, and I would have a side that was work that was needed to be completed and work that was already finished or that they were almost near finishing. And so then when they walked in, they were all right by the door, they'd grab it, they had a pencil and, and scrap paper in there if they needed it, they would grab it, go to their desks, sit down, and they didn't have to worry about if they had all their stuff with them. It saved myself a lot of stress. It saved the students because they knew exactly what they had, that they had that and they didn't have to think about it. But they all, it also taught them, okay, this is a great way to organize. And then at the end of the of class, we would organ, every student would, learn, would organize their folder for the next day. And then those posting the learning, learning objects, objectives and tying to the purpose. So often I hear even from my own kids, I don't know why I have to do this because they told me to do it, right? But if the teacher takes a moment to explain, here's why we're doing this activity. We're reading this paragraph today so that tomorrow we can discuss it. And then we're going to be doing this with it. And if they know that purpose, then it's not this, we're just doing this because you told me so. And then providing them examples of completed work. I mentioned this before. If they know what something can look like and what your expectations are, it really helps decrease the anxiety involved and keeps them from feeling overwhelmed. 
And then modeling those expectations, talking them through it, explaining the why and what needs to happen. Another great strategy for executive function are use of colors. The colors help us make connections with our brain and recall and track and organize our tasks. So some examples of ways to do this is having students highlight key words in the same color the, or the vocabulary words they need to look, look up or words to remember. Or if you have a student who's struggling to take notes, give them the teacher's notes and then they highlight with the different colors. You can teach them, they can set up their own color system. And then another thing I always did for students was setting up a color system to separate each subject or task. And here's an example. So with math, right? You, you think about it with reading maybe or with vocabulary, but here's an example. So a word problem in math, highlight the, the numbers, the, the numbers that they're going to need for that equation, highlight them in one color, and then highlight the other words that are tied to what they're to the symbol they're going to be needing to do to solve that problem. And you can see down below that then it's easy for them to pull all the pieces out and they'll know and they won't miss those pieces. It, then they're not overwhelmed by the words in those problems. Another great way is this, the words into math example. A lot of students struggle with remembering what word goes with which symbol for math. And so giving students this tool for what word goes with that symbol. So for example, multiplication, okay, that those words are product times multiple twice. Those go to, oh, okay, I saw that word. That means I have to do multiplication. It's not cheating. It's teaching the students to connect the word with the symbol to solve that problem. And then, like I said before, it's a picture, it's a visual picture to help draw from that working memory and help with that executive function. Because as adolescents are developing, our brains are developing, they need those pictures to keep it in order and not have to think, oh, oh, oh. And I, even with words, you can do that. If you tie it all together, it makes it easier for students. And there's no reason that it can't happen for kids this way. It's that we've been trained as educators. Well, you're, that's cheating. And it's not. It's, help, it's a tool and resource to help with executive function. Here's another example. I don't know if any of you have heard of Sarah Ward or been trained in Sarah Ward, but she, her training is all about executive function. And so here's an example of some of it. So you can see that Number one is starting at the, with the end in mind. Number one is what will it look like when I get done? And maybe they draw a future sketch or picture or write some words or notes with it. Then you backward plan. Step two, what are the steps that need to be done? Approximately how long will I be taking on each step? Three, get ready. What do I need to accomplish this? And then it moves to four. What materials do I need to do the steps? And then you set up, the, the student sets up their space. Five, sketch the time, create it and mark a halfway point or set a timer and alert at the halfway point. Check in at the halfway point and determine if there are any time robbers. They call them time robbers, but you can call them time wasters, distractors, whatever, you can make it your own. And if you get a hit a time waster, you identify it, you remove it, and you go back and replan and put yourself back on track. Just because you, you had a time waster or a time robber occur doesn't mean that you can't get back on track. And then six, know when to stop. Know when that task is completed. A lot of students have perfectionism or fear or anxiety about turning things in. And sometimes it's just saying, okay, I'm done. I'm gonna turn it in and I'm gonna get that off my plate. And then that time to reflect what worked, what didn't work, what do I wanna do differently next time? Feeling that success as well. And the teacher, 
the adults recognize you did it. I'm proud of you. And each step along the day of the way, giving them that positive reinforcement and support to keep them going. Next, examples of organization. Um, those little accordion folders are great. They can label them by subject. Students can put, put their work by subject in there. And when, as they finish their work, there can be a section for work that needs to be turned in. And then another idea is a color-coded planner. Calendars, calendar reminders, we all use our phones now. There are lots of apps out there for organization and keeping ourselves on tasks. Students like to engage in those. And if they, you don't allow phones in your school, you can use them with their Chromebooks. That is also another great way because it gives not only auditory reminders, but also visual reminders. And then the drawer system. Some students need more specific one, two, three. So you can get those three little drawers, five drawers, and for each of their tasks, what they need, the materials, what they need to do is in each drawer. And as they complete, they complete number one, pull it out, it's finished, put it back in, then move to the next drawer. Um, visual checklists are great, as well as a visual timer. There's watches that do visual timers, there's apps with visual timers, or you can buy those for individual student desks or within your classroom. And then you can set that and students can actually see the red going down to help them stay on task and stay focused and know when the time is up. These visual timers and using timers also help with your transitions so that students aren't like, what, we're done? They can see for themselves that it's almost time. And then when you're saying, okay, time to take a break or time to move on to the next activity, it's, they're not shocked. And then our learning space. Materials need to be organized. Sometimes a great idea is teaching students to put the materials that need to be done on the left-hand side of the desk. When they're finished, move it to the right. That keeps things from getting lost. And then prioritizing the work and actionable steps. Consider the order based on the energy needed. So I know in the video, it said, eat the frog. What is your most difficult task? For some students, they have to work the opposite way. They need to work into doing an easier task to get them engaged and settled and then move to the maybe most difficult and then back to an easier and more difficult or vice versa. That's where we talk with our students and plan like that classroom did, what are they going to do first? Giving them the choice of what is going to happen first, next, last can go long ways to getting them to work completion or even just task initiation. And then another component that we often fail to think about is that visual and auditory distractions and clutter. So in my kids' elementary school, they actually, in their classrooms, had curtains that they would put over posters and things that were not being used. And they would then draw the curtains back when that point of instruction came to limit that visual distraction because when we're seeing things, when we're hearing things, that's just more that our brains have to take in and manage. Um, if it's noisy, allowing students to listen to music or using noise canceling headphones, or if they need a different space, it, it can go a long ways to help them focus. You can also, if you can't fit, do those things in your school or your classroom, have them turn to or to wall, set up a little folder cubicle, and then also location of seating that is based on an individual learner. A lot of times with IEPs, I'll see the accommodation preferential seating. Okay, what does that mean? Preferential seating, is that at the front of the room? Is it near a door because that student might need to take a, a sensory break or a brain break? Or is it at the back of the room so that they can have their own quiet, own space and not be a distraction? or be distracted. So when we're saying location of seating, consider that student and where they are in the classroom. And motivation, how do we motivate students? Here's some great simple ways. And every student is motivated in a different way, just like every adult is motivated in a different way. 
And at GSN, we do an Indigo survey, which actually tells you what your motivators are. So for me, if you tried to give me a sticker or a tangible reward, I wouldn't care because I'm not utilitarian. But boy, if you gave me the opportunity to help others, so I'm highly social, meaning I want to help others. If you told me, if you get your work done, Donna, then you can go and help this person or do this for me, I'd be done. So really understanding what motivates each individual student and giving them those rewards, providing that positive feedback and appreciation, even for the most small of tasks, and then providing with that structured and or times for movement or brain breaks is important too. These can all help students stay motivated and complete the task or even initiate a task. And like I mentioned before, choices. And like the video said, choices to set up their tasks, giving them breaks, talking about what subjects and tasks and the order of tasks, even having them tell you what it would be a good motivator or reward for them if they complete that activity. Not every student is motivated by grades. And not every, every educator is even motivated by grades. Let's talk about some motivators and rewards. Maybe you build in some individual or some classroom goal rewards, or even just simple stickers. You got this task done, you got this task done. Talk to the kids, they have great ideas and that can feel that make them feel empowered and like they want to do for you or do for themselves. So some ideas for learning supports. We often say, did you get that? And students will say yes or no. That's not really a check for understanding. We need to check for understanding by asking the learner to restate in their own words what their understanding is. So for example, can you tell me what you need to do next? Or can you tell me what I just said or what your understanding of what I just said? And if it's incorrect, you can clarify in a gentle way or you get in insight into, okay, maybe I need to teach that a little more in depth for this student. Another great way is a visual cue for requesting support. I know for my son, he will never raise his hand in class. He's shy and quiet. So with his teachers, we've set up a system where if his pencil is turned a certain way on his desk or his pen is placed at the top of his desk, that means he needs help. And then he's not having to raise his hand and ask for help or being afraid to look different, being afraid to be the only one to not know. And for that teacher, okay, I need to check in on this student. Or it can be a hand cue. You set that up with the student ahead of time. And for students who over ask or rely on, on the teacher for help, some, another strategy is limiting the number of post-it flags. So putting those post, little post-it flags on the side of the desk saying, okay, you get three questions during this subject. And each of these flags represents one question. And when you ask a question, you give me that flag. And when you're all out of flags, no more questions. Or, and you can even say, maybe you don't have questions. You can keep those for the next activity. Another strategy is three before me. Ask three other students before you ask me. Or when they do ask a question, asking what did you do to find the answer? Or what could you do? Or where might you find the answer to that? Or how might you find the answer to that? Putting that ownership of exploration on the student. So I've given you a lot to think about and a lot of information. And it's not just my brain or GSN's ideas that work for this. So we're gonna divide you out into breakout rooms. And Ellen's going to put the link to the document in the chat. So before we leave to our breakout rooms, make sure to click on the link that Ellen's posting, open it up on your computer. And when you're in the breakout rooms, you will be completing the document and adding your ideas for strategies that you've utilized in each of the areas that we reviewed. So in your breakout rooms, this is you guys getting to explore ideas, share with each other, and collaborate. 
about how we can help students with executive function and planning and completing tasks and assignments. So Ellen posted the link. I'll give you a second to open it. And then Ellen, how much time should we spend in the breakout rooms? I have 10 minutes. Okay. Start with right. that. And if people need more time, we can, we can add on a few minutes. Okay. And be sure to connect with each other, share where you're from. And Ellen and I might be popping in and out of your breakout rooms to see how things are going. So we're going to go into those breakout rooms. If any of you have questions, please post them. All right. So I was, I ended up joining one of the groups and we worked on it together, but you guys can see that there's a lot of great ideas out here. And with the link that you get from Ellen, you'll also have the links to this document. So you can go back and review and keep your ideas in mind that everybody came together. Um, one that really I liked to, that I love, and we didn't add it into this presentation today was Maslow before Bloom. Um, that's taking care, and Mark share, shared that, that, they, that he's a counselor and they really use that in their school. So Maslow before Bloom means taking care of the students' basic needs, making sure that they're comfortable, safe, and have their basic needs met before placing academic learning or learning expectations on them. It's so critical to everything that we do as individual people. If our basic needs are not met, we are not in a space to learn or grow or even hear from others or even do things for ourselves. So thank you for reminding us of that, Mark. So let me get back to our presentation. Um, just a second. Maybe. Okay, here we go. I just wanted to correct you. It was Mike. Mike. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> sorry, Mike. Okay, can everybody see this? Yep, we can see it. Yes. Okay. So that's our um, breakout room activity. Thank you all for participating. And again, go back and look at that. So now it's time for Q&A. With everything you guys discussed in your rooms, with everything you heard today, are there any questions out there that we left unresolved or that you'd like to know more about? And if, if you think of any as we keep going, just post them in the chat. So, we have more of these forums coming up. Um, we have our link to register as well. And you can see that we're doing on December 6th, the Mindful Movement for Youth, and January 31st, the Trauma-Informed Teaching Part 1. So hopefully you can join us and also feel free to share these forums with other colleagues, with other people, even they don't even have to be educators, parents. We've had lots of parents come and learn. We've had people in the medical field come and learn. So this is for anyone and everyone. You don't have to be an educator to join us. So how can we support? Um, Generation Schools, we have lots of different activities on our website and resources on our websites. Um, we also get work with schools and districts around the nation to obtain private donor and grant funding to then go in and, and support you through professional development, curriculum, coaching, mentoring, observations. We do all pieces of, of education at GSN. It's, it's not just social emotional learning, executive function, but really anything. Turnaround leadership, our special education, we can support you with that. Multi-tiered systems of support health and wellness um, we're working we actually got a grant for a district here in colorado to do a community greenhouse really if there's something that your school wants to do contact us connect with us and we will do our best to find a way to make it happen that's what we do with gsn and brilliant minds coming together to create and support schools and Lastly, here's that survey we talked about at the beginning. Ellen's going to post the link, or she did post the link in the chat. We'll be posting the link to the survey. Please come take a moment to complete that survey before you go today. And then that will give you all the resources and everything that we have, including your certificate of participation. 
So I'll give it a second for Ellen to post that link. There you go, there's that feedback survey link. And lastly, thank you for joining us today. Again, I'm Donna Trujillo. My email is there. If you ever have questions or wanna explore what we can do for you further, please feel free to reach out at any time. And I appreciate all of your participation and sticking with us, whether it's morning, night, or middle of the day from wherever you are. Thank you so much. And we'll stick around, Ellen, Sierra, and I will stick around with you all for a bit if you have any questions.